Um, while we're waiting for the questions to come up, and, I, and I'll read them, I have one that I'm going to use my uh, poster's prerogative, and, and, and that is um, the idea of the collaboration between different agencies and different interest groups to pay for this. Um, Cheryl had talked about nonprofits, and what we're normally used to here in the community is our residents get together, staff conducts a public process, we come to some sort of plan, they write all that stuff up on the wall, they come back to us and say, this is what you said, and eventually the council agrees on it, and we're just agreeing internally. So, nonprofits, number one, are separate agencies, um, and there's often the issue of how does a donor affect public policy because it's their dollars and they're saying, you know, this is what we wanted for and not. So one part of the question is how do nonprofits relate to public agencies when people are choosing to give money to them and they have a specific mission? And then two, um, the other public agencies like the colleges, uh, SMC is part of our airport, they're a public agency, they have a lot of ability to buy land and do on their own what they want, regardless of what the city wants. Um, so we also have a situation here where uh, Henry Waxman is stepping down now. We have a congressional race. Um, how are the congressional candidates and who assumes that seat and how they're going to work with the feds? So in terms of models where we actually have cities, counties um, that aren't Santa Monica working together with the whole city where the land is, maybe a little bit of discussion about how those models have actually worked, what the public process is, how those different uh, elements of different desires come together to actually form something in the end. So I throw that up, then I'll read people's other questions and we'll follow up with those. One thing I'd like to start, one example of a nonprofit and a governmental agency is the Ed Foundation, where the money is donated but to be used for education. Sometimes people donate for a specific project in mind, but other times it is just given. You know, it's the same thing when you look at the, the Parks Foundation. Sometimes you may have a directed donation and said, I'll give it to you, but you know, I want to put a universe accessible playground. But otherwise, people are donating, even though the money they know is going to go to the city. Um, it usually works well. One, you get a tax deduction. And two, then the nonprofit will work with the city. One advantage, and that's why it works well, is some people feel if I give money to a city, somehow it gets lost in the process and pretty soon it's used for the general fund. So when a nonprofit and cities are working together, the nonprofit has more control over making sure that the money works. On the other hand, it's a great advantage to the city to be able to get these funds so they make sure there's a collaboration between the two. Can I follow up with a question? Um, I almost feel like bringing Barbara and Sitcho up here, but you were involved through on the Rec and Parks Commission during the Annenberg Beach House thing. Were there, I mean, I know that Paul Annenberg said you have to do this in 18 months, but aside from that, was it a difficult way to make this work? Or, I mean, because you already had a plan, but like, how did that go? Well, no, we actually, you know, the planning was done during this period. It was the public process. Right. The key, and what was impressive to me, it was a little longer than 18 months because of the lawsuit, but it's something that I've always felt. Frequently, when a city gets involved in doing something, you know, I always look at my life expectancy as I get older, I say, I don't think I'm going to be here to see it. It does show that if there's enough money involved and an incentive, it can be done in a short period of time. But as, as far as I recall, is they weren't involved in the plans. There were not plans there. Their view was they wanted to see it done. They wanted it, you know, wisely they put a time parameter because they too would have been waiting forever. But, you know, the key factor is they were not interfering. They're not saying we want it this way. And from memory, I may be wrong, they weren't asking for naming rights, I believe. You know, the concept from the city thought it would be a nice idea to name them. Um, but sometimes, you know, people would give it, and that's a fact, like the Broad Theater. Um, but it, 
they really do work well if the city is willing to cooperate and the nonprofit. The collaboration has been done quite successful. And before Esther jumps in, there were just two questions that I, I want to just add on to what I threw out there because they're related and we wanted to include everybody's voices here. Um, one person talked about how since we've been sharing the pollution and noise in the airport on the west side between in LA and Santa Monica, is there precedent for simultaneous bonds in Santa Monica and LA? And then a second person asked about the process where the Presidio in San Francisco was converted and there are lessons for it from that. So just throw that into the mix. Okay, so if I can tie that together. To, to me, there, there are different kinds of nonprofits. I think that question was really uh, aimed at private foundations, philanthropic foundations that give. But there's a whole host of other kinds of nonprofits, my organization being one of them, that, that do work as well. It's different than that. So again, I think that it's very important for you to back up and ask yourself, how can we fund a really good planning process? I mean, I'll give you at least one example. But this is what we did in the Baldwin Hills. We're a nonprofit. We raise money from private foundations and also from some public agencies to do a two-year planning process. We hire landscape architects. We hire geologists. We hired uh, special engineers. We had a whole we had a whole host of ecologists. We had actually hired a team from the LA Natural History Museum to go out and do an ecological assessment because we needed to do that because we actually have stuff there. Don't have anything in San Juan Airport. But you, we, we put in place the legal team, the financial team, the policy team, and then we, as I said, we did 200 community meetings. We had all kinds of designs. We went out and we talked to people and we went back to the drawing board. And out of that came a plan. And the sand and the sea essentially was, I mean, you knew what you needed to do there. There was not a big mystery. There had been a task force. There's a lot of, but, yeah. but still, yeah. I mean, there was. Right, they done that. It wasn't like there were a lot of choices. Right. Right. I mean, maybe what color different things were going to be, but you knew what you needed to do there generally. Here, you don't know what you need to do. And that really is the starting point. I think that you could raise some private funding to in fact do that kind of an analysis and plan. And if you were looking at habitat and water, there may even be some small public grants uh, at a state or regional scale that would, would look at that too. I don't know, I'd have to, to, to look at that. Well, let me ask you a question. When you did Baldwin Hills, what was the governmental agency that owned the property? Because I have to tell you, the city of Santa Monica is kind of, they like to do, they don't, uh, it would be tough for us to tell them <laughs> what to do with their land. But, uh, you know, so. But I think you can phrase that in a different okay, way. That's what and, and, that go, and that goes back again to an idea of regional collaboration. So in Baldwin Hills, it was County of Los Angeles owned land, City of LA owned land, Clover City owned land, was surrounded by all those cities. In Inglewood wasn't too far away, and then there was a bunch of private land as well. We just went and did it. We didn't ask permission for anybody. We just said, we're, making, we're going to do a plan. We, Put everybody together. We invited everybody, so it was it was a very inclu extremely inclusive process. Two hundred communities is a really a lot of meetings uh, and, and workshops. So I think that there's a model there. Remember, this park or this land, excuse me, abuts the city of LA. I mean, so LA park is in LA. And part okay, there you go. So who cares? And how many times do you think about when you're going to a park, what city is it? Do you care? You look at the resource that's in a park, right? I mean, I mean, cities care, and of course we care, but at the ground level, from a resource base and who's going to use it, we don't really care. We go, we go to the park because we want to do. So we don't go ride the tram to the park, whatever it is, right? So there's a different different reasons. Uh, the Presidio is a really good thing to look at, even though it's clearly on a much larger scale. Of repurposing, got a lot of buildings, had a lot of pavement, a lot of those things. And they put a lot of different uses together. Now remember that one of the reasons the Presidio has been successful is that they are leasing those buildings and they have some very exciting repurposing and uses that they concentrated in different areas and have visions for that. So they've got their places that are where the Greens restaurant is, and we've got some commercial use and different kinds of tenants that they were trying to attract. I mean, Santa Monica being the center of sustainability and the Western Hemisphere certainly seems that that would be a piece that could that that could be linked in here in a very productive way. Well, that, that's a good segue to one of our other questions: uh, sustainability and water. And I also want to use that as a segue to recognize another, both former and current uh, representative for us, uh, our former mayor Judy Abdo, who's here. Judy, we can get up there. Judy, Judy served as representative on the Metropolitan 
water district board, and one of the ideas I personally had, which fits in with some of the stuff um, has said is maybe down the line we ought to be exploring whether there could be a regional water storage role that could also pay for some of the costs of excavating and cleaning and then putting a big tank down there. But in that vein about water um, and sustainability, one of the folks here said, can we stop using the term green, Southern Cal is not particularly green except when it rains, which hasn't happened too much, and a sustainable natural habitat won't have that much green. Um, and uh, can, can we maybe speak a little bit to the idea about creating, you talked about the habitat that used to be there and kind of the difference between we need to put back exactly what was there in contrast to relating to what's there today and how does sustainability fit into that? Well, I'm a, I'm a realist. I am not wed into everything having to be exactly the way it was before Christopher Columbus ever set foot on soil and what became the United States. However, there are places where you want to do that. And whoever has said that, that natural stuff's not green, you need to go take, whoever said that, you need to go take a trip out to the Santa Monica Mountains and take a look up. Because even in this horrific drought, those hillsides are still green. Now, the grasslands don't stay green. But the habitat that naturally would have been here, our coastal sage scrub and all those mixture of species, stay green. It's a different, it's not a verdant green, it ain't Scotland, but it's a Mediterranean green like Italy or France or Greece, a lot of other Mediterranean uh, environments around the world. So I think that's again part of the education that we, we have to put our own selves through what, what we do. My answer to that is a very pragmatic answer. You need to pay for this damn thing. What do you need to do here? that's going to build support at a national, federal, regional, state level. What are the things that are important? If one of those is habitat, then damn it, do habitat. It might also be the right thing to do. But you want to be pragmatic also about how you're going to attract enough uh, support. I wanted to get back to this idea of collaboration and what you said about the city of Santa Monica. This landscape, or this piece of land, is so important in this area. In my view, as a person who's done a lot of planning, it transcends the issue of boundary, jurisdictional boundaries. This, this goes beyond, it's just a city issue. There are reasons that we have regional parks. They may be in a city, but they're called a regional park for a reason. County has regional parks that are not just on county property. Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy has state property in city boundaries. So I think we need to move a little bit away from this idea that, well, just because it's in the city, that we've got to do it this way, and really look at how important this particular land is for in this entire region. If I could just add, and, and one thing, I think, you know, part of the issue is, is, that's come up before is where if the city is paying for it, it should be for the citizens. But what we're talking about here is looking for money and ways that a substantial portion, if not most of it, could be paid for in other ways. And then I think the regional concept can definitely uh, help. You know, I think that the one important factor, but there's enough land there, is, I can tell you it was playing fields. You know, the question was, I live on the north side, and someone said, you know, why would people want to pay for it? Well, one, if it's the way Esther's talking about, then they would find it's worthwhile even if you live there. But the other factor, and that's what's nice about this, is enough land that you can do a lot of things. And so as you open up the playing fields, you get the people from the north side. You can permit in a certain way that for certain things, the people in Santa Monica benefit from it. But then in other ways, on a much broader scale, that people from the entire region benefit. So you really can accomplish both a regional park with benefits to the citizens of Santa Monica so they support the concept. So I think it's doable, it just has to be planned and sold the right way. Yeah, I do want to point out um, that this discussion should be, in effect, expanding our minds because this is a, for the west side of LA and for Santa Monica, a big piece of park, a big piece of land. It's not two square miles, no. but the acreage there that we would have for a park is more than all the park acreage in Santa Monica combined. Wow. Uh, yeah, thanks. That we have about 130 acres of parks in Santa Monica. I'm not talking about the beach, I'm talking about parks. 
as I said, this could easily be between 165 and 190 acres. So you could take, you could triple the size of Clover Park, which is about 18 acres, in just a corner of this park and get all those, you know, triple the number of fields over there, barbecues, all that kind of stuff, and still have room to have habitat, trails, and all that kind of stuff. I think it's, this is, it's, it's, uh, it's not one or the other. It's how to make something that really works, uh, getting all these things. It'd be interesting to add the acre, again, moving beyond just the city of Santa Monica and west of the 405 and looking at it at some radius, what's the park acreage? And do that yes. comparison that's so you're right. starting to move beyond just you the city. See, and that's how you make a regional argument. Yeah. A quick off for something I started mentioning before, and then we have a couple other questions. Um, one person had asked what was the time frame for the 200 public meetings. Not yet. Good question. We were on work speed. Uh, about two years. So for, the, for those of you who uh, played with Legos when you were a kid, that was one of those that really gets you to be thinking about moving everything around and kind of recreating your reality. And we have a question in that vein, which I would say as context reminds me of something that Gene Gebbin came to the council, I think he had two ideas many years ago. One was that we should take the I-10 freeway and put it underneath downtown Santa Monica, and then use the Arroyo for where the Expo line would come in, which was an interesting one. Another one was take the high school, when we were talking about expanding the, the Civic Center, take the high school and um, put it where the college is and put the college at the airport for people who wanted to get the um, traffic from you know, Santa Monica College out of Sunset Park. But in that vein, um, another kind of big picture one is Memorial Park will be dramatically altered with a new metro rail stop at 17th Street. It's also an issue for planners um, for, okay, so that's become an issue to plan around that station. What's your opinion of selling Memorial Park to be used for the much needed parking and proposed retail and housing space around the 17th Street station and using that money to help fund this project, including the creation of a much needed properly built sports complex for baseball, softball, and other school youth and adult groups currently at Memorial Park? Having been someone involved with this, that issue for a long time, the biggest concern is you know, if you sold it now, you know, it's a long way off, and you may never get the airport back. That's number one. Number two, it can take a long time. And for someone that has fought forever to make sure, at least on plans, the soccer field remains at the Civic Center, the problem you face is that as soon as you get rid of those playing fields, you just may never get them back again. And so from that standpoint, you know, if we had the airport now and they started to develop it, then shifting things around can make sense. But otherwise, you're taking open space and playing fields from an area that doesn't have a lot around it, getting rid of it in the hopes that maybe later on you would have the uh, playing field. So I think it would be a concept. I can tell you, every you know, youth group and field user, having been to the protest, would be against it. I think it would be a, a terrible idea. I agree with Neil. And sort of the opposite of what Esther was saying is we don't want, you know, we have to say we're going out like the branch libraries. We don't want to do the reverse and say we're going to build this new airport park sacrificing our neighborhood parks. That would be, to me, just, it would be. If you've got a map, and we've done this on Rexham Park, and looked at where all the parks were, you know, when you start getting to the north side, there's not a lot of parks. Memorial, for many, is you know, as close as you get, take that away, and then all of a sudden you have almost no parks within any walking distance. I think, Phil, you might remind us, isn't there some basic number that we have in the city you're saying every resident should be no more than... A quarter mile away from public green space, public park space. And in our city right now, Esther would like this figure, we're at 1.45 acres of park space per thousand residents, which is, if you look at comparable cities to Santa Monica throughout California, we are at the bottom of the 10 most comparable cities to us in park space. So Even though we do a fantastic job. We had two other questions. One was um, maybe not specifically on funding the airport per se, but speaking of 
can somebody speak about the economic impact on health care costs and cost savings due, due to a reduction in greenhouse gases if the airport became a park? Maybe that's rhetorical. Another question is converted, and anybody wants to comment on that? But I think we, I mean, we've seen materials that are put together by that LA, uh, what was the LA movement to get more parks funding? That they have a lot of, yes, yeah. They have a lot of data showing that uh, the health benefits of parks goes into money. It's much the same as, uh, you know, the data. It's kind of a different concept, or the same concept, but very different context about if you can house homeless people. The money that you spend housing them is a lot less than the money that you spend for them in the hospital or whatever. And so the money that you put into park, the money that you put into parks, so somebody can hear me out there, is looks like, oh boy, you're spending a lot of money on parks, but the society saves money on the health care costs. What would, I and it's more than money for what was the name? It's called uh, People for Parks. People for Parks. There's a lot of data out there. I just I don't have those numbers at my yeah. fingertips. But I thought, I thought like now we're preventing thing. health problems. In, in addition, you know, people you know, look at the health care costs. There's also another element, and that is reduction in crime. Because you know, the one thing that has been proven over and over again, you know, if you have things for kids to do and more things, the crime is reduced. In fact, since I'm on the Sound Police Activity Board, and PALS started in New York when policemen kept arresting the same kids over and over again and said, you know, why do you, you know we're going to arrest you, why do you keep vandalizing things? And they said, because we have nothing else to do. So that is another key element, and if you have it, a park, a regional park, the way Esther's describing it, there's just so many different things and so many opportunities, plus with increased playing fields. Right now, a lot of kids can't get into new sports because there's a lack of playing fields. You expand that, more kids are in. So in addition to health costs, you're also going to have a great savings from you know, crime. And more than that, you're just going to be saving kids from... So, so there's a lot of... If you look into all of the side benefits of more open space, it just keeps going on and on. Bring down the obesity rate. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the huge reduction, I guess, we can't answer your question about particulates in the air, but obviously that would be reduced. But more importantly, you want your citizens to be active. You want your citizens to be able to walk, to be able to play, to be outside because the health benefit is obvious. The more we have people outside doing things, the less they'll have to go to the doctor, the more fit they'll be, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have to run. It just means even walking, just being outside. So that's a huge health benefit of having more parkland. So, um, and yes, Jerry, we'll, we will include you. Um, but, but first, we have to deal with these um, cards. And Jerry's a special resource for our community. Um, some of the folks that uh, I run into when I just speak as a resident being for this idea and also uh, for the corollary of capping our freeway and covering that as well, um, the I-10, and turning that into a park. Uh, some folks I run into say, we already have Santa Monica Mountains. We can go there in a couple minutes. Why do we need to pay for so much park right here when it's so close by? If you're on the bond campaign, um, and you have to confront that, if your polling says that's a percentage of people that we've got voter fatigue, we've paid for college bonds, and school bonds, and city bonds, and county, like Vegas mayor, all this stuff, <laughs> what argument do you use for those type of people? Maybe they're the swing 10 or 15 percent. I think it's a wrong question at this point. I, I don't think we need to worry about that stuff right now. You're, you're getting into a level of detail completely not important right now. That's like the downright in the weeds. We're down there in the invertebrates under the soil about three feet down. <laughs> that, you'll, you'll figure that out. That's great <laughs> You need to be asking much bigger questions. What the hell are you going to do here that's exciting and big and wonderful that's going to get a lot of support? You do your polling way early on and you do community meetings so that you're dealing with a lot of that. Of course, there's always going to be a few naysayers. But I guarantee you that if you have a really big, exciting idea that is well thought out and well planned and has science behind it and has good planning behind it and has good design behind it and has 
exhaustive community involvement and as a regional collaboration and has looked at the biology and the ecology and both the human and the, the natural part, you will have a huge groundswell of support for something that is new and different and exciting that has not been done on the west side of Los Angeles. And, and it's really important to be thinking like that. The health stuff, of course the health stuff, but let's face it, this property is not in the middle of an extremely economically disadvantaged area that has no recreational opportunities. So that argument is a good argument, but it's not going to be a selling point. You are not going to go to the bank on building this park is critical to increase the health of the surrounding community. And I mean, laughing, it's true. I mean, it's true. So let's not get hung up on that. Let's go back to what needs to happen here and how can you raise the funding to do a really good regional collaboration and who are the state experts that you should get involved but think about it at that scale so that you have something that is a higher and better use than an airport so that you move out of it just being this localized area and, and by the time you get to your bond campaign you will have this enormous support for what you're trying to do and there won't be that question is the vice chair of the airport commission peter can you please uh right here give her a hand as well And uh, we have, I have a closing question that we're going to ask here, but uh, we're going to make the Jerry Rubin exception. No, 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 I understand. And because we made the Jerry Rubin exception, we're going to ask um, this lady as well to both of you ask your question or comment together. Um, give the uh, panel a quick chance to respond to both of those, and then we have a closing question. So, Jerry first. Yeah. Well. First of all, I just want to say how great it is to have experienced people up here that have done stuff before, and it's, it's so encouraging to see all this, too. And some of the ideas I've heard about water retention, it sounds like a great idea I hadn't heard before. But I just wanted to ask a question, let's understand. A bond measure, whatever it is, and you've had experience, that would only be up to the voters of Santa Monica, right? So even when we're talking about regional things, it's only going to be Santa Monica residents that vote on it. Is that correct? That's correct, right? Well, that is if it's a general obligation bond. Okay. If it's a revenue bond, and it could be supported by revenues from the facility. There would be more. It's, but then it's not a public vote issue. That then would become the city decision maker's issue. Okay, got it. And the other thing is, and Cheryl was talking about this, and I just know from everybody in Santa Monica, is in favor of parks and recreation. And they're also very much in touch with education and art. How could it be done in a combination that this park and this bond measure would also include educational park-related facilities or art-related park facilities to appeal in that way in the broader park thing? So it's cultural educational, recreational, and environmental. So I'm sorry, you, Mr. Rubin, you will have to defer, hold on to that question until the community workshops start, and then we will be discussing that in great detail for many hours. <laughs> Encouraging it okay, I, I will say that when we had our workshop, the one that we've had so far, all of those things came up. Good. Very and then please, your question. Trained, my name is Dr. Shalini Jane, and I have trained at Santa Monica Hospital. Um, I graduated a family practice medicine residency in 2004, and I have been um, serving the community of Santa Monica and Malibu since then. And I um, would like to know how best to funnel money into this cause. Yeah, we got the money, that's a good thing. Yes. I would like to invite you, along with Esther, every, all the panelists, to come to an airport to park planning meeting and we can discuss these kind of things within the group. The thing okay. is, so sign up on the website, and you'll get notified by us, and we'll be having more planning. We'll, you'll be notified about planning. Yeah, that's so fantastic, and I would love to. I just said, in the middle of something right. like, I would like, I would like, like to at least point out, I know your group is very active now. This has been a, for more than 20 years. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's because it, I'm one of the people. What? Yeah. Right. We have been <laughs> looking and trying to find ways. Right. And how many signed a petition in the late '80s to fight the Reliance Project right. at the airport? Right. We all have good roots in this. Right. Okay. So let's let's, was, let's go to the last question, um, which came in to say, what can be done?
to help win the lawsuit, which of course isn't really on the financing, but I would just say as a follow-up, um, do any of you believe that the courts, which sometimes we hear are influenced by the public context in which they make a decision, would be influenced if there is a growing regional movement to convert the airport into a park, do you believe that that would have any bearing on the FAA suits as well? So both, how do we win the lawsuit, and does this movement affect that context? Why don't we just get some good lawyers? Well, I gotta ask these folks. And we really actually have very good lawyers. There's a very good team on it. Both sides have made very persuasive arguments. And so we just, it comes down to the judge. You know, we don't know what a judge is gonna do. This judge seems to be very no-nonsense. No the city and the city's attorneys are happy with the judge that we got. And so, you know, now it's just in his hands. So we have to see how he uh, rules on the issues at hand and whether the motion will be dismissed. With respect to, you know, public support to win lawsuits, it really depends, again, upon the judge. So, um, you know, I don't know this judge. I really can't comment on that. Yeah, I, but I want to add that it goes beyond the court case, and one of the reasons we set up Airport to Park was to create, quite frankly, a political movement at every level, starting the city, but of course the county, the state, and the federal. And whatever happens with the lawsuit, and quite frankly, I think the city has a very good case if you've read the pleadings, and we have a judge who really seems to understand that the city has to make a decision, and it's on a time frame for this, which is very important for the substance of the case. But should, even should we lose the case, it's still a federal issue. And the FAA ultimately has to respond to the political process. The FAA has in its bureaucratic genes to protect aviation. That's what they do. But if we have our Congress repres congressional representatives, Karen Bass has already said uh, she wants to close the airport down. She represents LA just to the east of the airport. Henry Waxman is now retiring. Uh, he has been leaning, moving in the direction, let's say, of, oppose, of opposing the airport. It's very important for whoever runs for Henry Waxman's seat to be asked what his or her position is on the airport. Mm -hmm. And we, that, be, that needs to be very clear because if we lose the lawsuit, we have other, by the way, there are other, even if the city loses the lawsuit, there are other strategies to close the airport down. It's, it's not the end of the day anyway. But ultimately, it's a federal political question. I just want to add one thing. I'm part of a lobby group for small business. Public can influence the legislature. So I do agree with Frank as a lawyer. I would not want to start a campaign yes. about how do we influence right. a judge. That's the fastest the way thing. to lose the decision. <laughs> yeah. But it's never too early because the one thing we don't know is the timing, the speed, what happens. I agree there's a lot of federal issues. It's going to come down to a lot of legislative issues. That's where I think everyone here and others can really you know, get the message across that this airport should be... What, what about the supervisor? Okay, so let, let, let me respond. Let me respond. Jerry? Jerry, Jerry yeah, let me, me respond a second. Okay, I, I have the utmost respect for Frank, but I strongly disagree with him on his position. I think that this is a local decision-maker process. Our elected officials are going to determine what happens at that airport. The federal government's rights at that airport expire in 2015. Now, they're trying to make a case that their rights extend to 2023, but contractually, they clearly expire in 2015. And we, at the, on the Airport Commission, have evaluated the agreements. We've made uh, over 10 recommendations to the City Council. The City Council has adopted four of them so far. They're doing them one at a time. And we think that we have the power to close that airport. So I don't think it's a federal issue. I don't look to our federal decision makers. I'm looking solely to our local decision makers because as proprietors of that airport, we have the right to affect changes there and we're going to affect that. And our, our decision makers are on board with us, they're listening, they're going forward with the changes that need to be made. And so we will have that property, the city will have that property, and it can be turned into a park, just like all of these panelists up here are saying tonight.
And with that, let's give a big hand to the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your group of our school and helping this movement in our city come together. Uh, I want to ask Mike Salazar from uh, the airport, airport park to come up here. He uh, wants to do something. This is one of those unrehearsed moments, I guess. I didn't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> Also was I just want to make a comment. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it as a question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to, uh, as a member of Airport to Park, uh, acknowledge that there, there are some other members here as well. Uh, John Fairweather, Gavin. Yeah, <laughs> Where's Mark? Oh, there's mine. Okay. Anybody else from our committee here? Of course, there's some. But I don't see that. And it's been fun working with all of the, the guys from Airport to Park, and, and, and you know, we're just very thankful that everybody's contributing so much. I mean, Frank and I are sitting up here tonight, but everybody has done so much. He's back. He's in the back. We were just. And, and, uh, and thank you, Mike. You're welcome. And one thing uh, Airport to Park would like to give our guest panelists. Um, a token, something green, something sustainable, and something to grow. And something that will plant at the new park. <laughs> yes. Well, you can keep it until then, but that's it in trust. No, it's not a marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and as an allergy sufferer, I appreciate that it is not a flower. <laughs> yes, although some do flower. Yeah. yeah, but not right here in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, folks. Thanks, everybody. Time to chat in the halls. Okay.